Thanks everybody for coming out for uh, another night of the Semi Slav. So uh, I know some people, we've got some new faces here, which is always cool. Uh, thanks for coming. Tonight we're gonna be going over um, part four, you agree with that, part four of the uh, Semi Slav. And we've been looking at the Moran for the last three weeks, all sorts of different lines. Tonight we're gonna look at the anti Morans, especially the positional ones. And then next class we'll have something extra special. Um, are you familiar with this opening at all? This is the, the Slav, and black makes sort of a triangle. And we're still looking at lines where white plays e3. In a couple of weeks, we're going to start looking at some of the really sharp, fun fireworks that can occur after bishop to g5. But we're still looking at the move e3, and black makes a useful developing move. And so far, we've only been looking at the move bishop to d3, which is the most natural developing move. You just put a bishop on the most active square. And then obviously black can take on c4 and play b5 and get all the stuff we've been looking at um, so far all month. But as we sort of noticed, and it did take three weeks to get through, it's because it's super theoretical, the lines with bishop to d3 here, uh, which is not for everybody's taste. And some people kind of want to avoid all of that theory completely if that's possible. So we're going to look at the move queen to c2. White just makes a nice, useful, developing move. The queen is nice on c2. We have more control over e4. And it, we're just waiting. We're saying, well, black, now it doesn't really make any sense for you to take here since I just get to develop um, on my own terms. So I played a useful move, and we could have had this position you know, if, you had, if I had played bishop to d3. So I've just made a useful move, and I've, I've improved over that position. So instead, what black tends to do here is he himself plays his own useful move bishop to d6. And this is where we're going to start. And we're actually going to look at three moves over the next two weeks. Today we're going to look at the positional anti-Morans, um, b3, which seems to be popular at club level. So we'll have a look at this. And you know, relatively very strong players have, have played this way. So it's a decent weapon. Bishop d3 is the main move. So we'll definitely have a look at this today. And then next week, assuming we get through all of this, because you never know, um, and I don't really want to rush in this series if we can avoid it, next week we're going to look at g4. And we're going to have a little fun, and hopefully there will be a lot of audience participation and playing in this move. So for those in the audience, you can go prep this all week and then come uh, face the class with it next week. So we're going to look at the uh, Shibalov Shirov Gambit which is obviously very sharp. You're just gambiting your g-pawn. What's that all about? We'll have a look at that next week. Um, but let's start with the move b3. This is where we're going to begin our coverage tonight, the move b3. White just solidifies the center. So now if you ever take on c4, I can just take back with a pawn. OK, very reasonable. So we castle. And now white's move here might kind of surprise you. Um, it's about time we develop this bishop, and then we castle. But what square should we go to? And it might surprise you that the most popular move is actually bishop to e2. It may appear that this is a more active square for the bishop, which is true. That's a better square for the bishop. However, sometimes uh, you're going to run into problems after e5 with the threat of e4. And black is castled, and white hasn't. Um, and it's not to say this is a, a bad move at all for white. You can certainly play this way. So we'll have a look at a couple of the lines here um, before we go back to bishop to e2, which is the more common path, e5. And um, you know, I've been having this discussion with some people here. There's an almost automatic move in this type of structure when they play e5. Before you do anything, like you capture on e5 or you do any of that, the almost automatic move is c takes d5. Um, this at least means that black is going to have a slightly compromised pawn structure, because now if we ever take on e5, you're going to end up with an isolated d pawn. So black should be ready for that when he plays this way. OK, the threat is e4. So there's actually two moves here. You can take on e5, or you can play knight to b5. Um, we'll look at these both just very briefly. So if you take, we can go here. And uh, the most common move is actually to take. And uh, after bishop to b2, the reason white doesn't play this way a lot is, well, for one, probably we can just play d4 and get rid of this pawn right away, which would be sort of 
um, would, which would equalize just because all of our pieces get out reasonably well. We can also play uh, rook to e8. This is actually the more common way to do it and to play for a little more. Um, and I think here, white should either castle kingside or play knight to e2. Those are popular moves. But surprisingly, a lot of people also castle queenside, which also feels a little bit dubious because there's a whole lot of air over here by your king. Um, and I know like computers hate it, but some people have played this way, and it's an aggressive, dynamic way for white to try to play. So these things are all possible, but uh, it's nothing really special or anything that black should worry about if white decides to play this way. Another interesting move is knight to b5, which is a recurring theme in lots of these lines. So if you play the semi-slav, you're gonna this is gonna be a move you might run into a lot of the time. Um, so our bishop is attacked, so we can check. And after they block, um, now white has to take back with a knight, otherwise e4. And with the bishop on d3, we get to gain this tempo. So this won't be true if the bishop had already started on e2, so we'll look at that in a minute. And uh, OK, among other moves, we have this move a6. And here white can do a couple different things. Um, you can go back to c3. And again, this is just nothing too special for white. Okay, if white wants to play this way, he has no real advantage at all. Also, he can consider this move, which is interesting. Also, it's a little riskier, because your knight can sometimes get trapped in there. It doesn't have a whole lot of places it can go. And here, actually, we get to do a very special maneuver, especially for us local people. Uh, we get to play rook a7. And what is this rook called? The Machuca Rook, yeah. Um, Danny Machuca is one of our teachers. You know, he's one of our, our best teachers here. He does a, a great job. And uh, he's, he's sort of famous for this Rook move. He always plays Rook A7 or, and in certain lines. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. It's like any other move. But he's famous for doing that. So around here, we like to call it the Machuca Rook. Very good. Um, and yeah, so White, White can play this way. He's probably just going to play Rook to C1. And um, those lines are interesting as well. But let's come back to the main course here. Uh, instead of going to the most active square, bishop e2. And what's funny is after developing all the pieces and castling and stuff, sometimes white in the future will actually end up playing this move. He just doesn't want to play it right away because it runs into uh, an immediate e5 with at least equality for black. And uh, OK, again, you can play the move e5 in this position. That's, that's a very possible move. The most popular move, though, is b6. And this is sort of important in this type of structure on the sounds on. So when Ben Simon hears this again, he's going to like that. Um, in general, in these structures, black wants to just be really, really patient. That's what you tend to do. So you play b6, bishop b7, queen e7. And then you, you wait and see what white does. And you put your rooks in all the right places. And then eventually, you play e5 or c5. You've got to get one of those breaks in as black. Um, you can play the move e5, which I don't think is actually a bad move at all. Uh, again, sort of the automatic reaction in this pawn structure they can take. And now if we go in for this same line, so after this check, this is actually a little bit better um, for team uh, white here, because this doesn't come with tempo anymore. So that's sort of the big difference. Uh, so you can get a position like this, which should actually be uh, quite fine for both sides. We can try to trade this guy. Uh, so the audience doesn't see it. You at home see it, though. So it's just some continuation like this might be possible, where black does have this isolated d pawn, but he does get a lot of activity. We notice just how active these knights are, the queen's coming in, et cetera. Um, and so you have to get some sort of really active play. And white is not very close to even putting any pressure at all on this d pawn. So this should be roughly equal. Um, so you can, if you like playing these kinds of positions as either side, you can go for it. Uh, but you obviously don't have to rush for this position. Instead of playing the move e5 here, you can just play b6. And again, the idea is we're going to develop, we're going to move our pieces, decide where these rooks go, et cetera. All right, so white always castles here. Bishop b7. Um, and then there's a couple of moves that people just develop all of their stuff. The bishop goes on b2, the queen goes on e7. And now it's actually interesting. So here, white kind of has to make the first decision. And it's one that I think is tough for a lot of club players. Where to put the rooks? 
And there's actually kind of two ideas. So we're going to look at two different games in these types of positions. Well, you can put your rooks on d1 and c1. So we'll, we'll look at this. You can also put the other rook on d1 and put a rook on e1. Uh, so white kind of has to decide how he wants to play. And the good news for black is, as a general rule in this exact position, it obviously varies in other positions, um, whatever white does, you copy him. If he puts his rooks on the e and d file, you can put your rooks on the e and d file, and that's always right. Um, so it's kind of easy in that sense for remembering where black should put his stuff. You just copy what white does in this type of position. Um, so first of all, let's look at this move, which I think is actually the more common way to play. So white is going to play with rooks on d1 and e1. And we're going to look at this interesting game between Ernst and Geary. And I like this one only because this is yeah, as much theory. This is the main, main, main line for this anti-Moran variation with b3. Um, so white decides where he puts his rooks, and black simply copies. OK. And now we see bishop d3. And we're still waiting. So black will at some point have to pick. Uh, is he going to play e5 or is he going to play c5? And in this game, he went ahead with the move e5. So the almost automatic response here from white, taking on d5. And we recapture. And now we're threatening to play e4. So he took. And after we take back, again, we get a position where black has an isolated d-pawn. Um, but what is you know, kind of surprising in a position like this for people that aren't used to this is very often it's, it's black that can get a big initiative and an attack going because these bishops are great. Th these knights are great. The queen can come in. It's easy to get these, these rooks into the action. Um, so it's, it's actually can happen rather quickly that black gets an initiative. In which position? When white takes on d5? After e4? Uh, did you give me this? OK, so you, I'm sorry, I can take here. And what's what are you saying? Aren't I crushing you? Yeah, it looks like black's probably winning. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's try to figure it out. Why don't we play e4? Um, let's see. So it takes. Um, so if here, I guess I can take here now. That's probably the point. Yeah, so I, yeah, I don't think I have to just strictly, although rook c8. Um, rook c8, bishop takes e4. Yeah, you like rook c8? Rook c8. Uh, I don't know, knight f6. No, if queen takes, then we do this and take something. Um, yeah, so that's. So it's actually interesting, but yeah, I think I can take and then take on c6. Um, and then, yeah, I didn't know what you were going to do here, because I don't think rook c8 even saves you. It's a good question, though. Um, OK, so he took here, which is sort of automatic. And yeah, it might surprise you that this is the main move, and this is still a dozen games or so. Um, so in this position. Black has managed to get the bishop pair. So he has these two bishops. And they're you know, very good at attacking. White, however, has uh, the positional plus, because black has this isolated pawn. And that's why people like to play this as white. It's a very positional way to play against the semi-slav. So players that want to try to exploit this in the long run, and it's already blockaded. So there's a lot of good things going for you. That's why people would play this as white. Um, and then we're not going to watch this whole game, because we've got a lot of games to show you tonight. But they played a whole bunch of maneuvers. And the game was just equal forever and ever and ever. Um, but uh, OK, Geary, who's playing with black here, world class. So he found this move. So now pause your videos and see if you can find. OK. Um, 
I, I gave it away too quick. And I did that when I showed it to somebody else earlier today, too. But, so I haven't actually looked at this in like five weeks, because I prepared all these lectures like all at once. So I don't, I don't remember any of these games. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so queen h5 check, exactly. And he went here, which is a big blunder. He should go back to g1, and then we can take this. So that was his point. So he stole a pawn. And the computers will still say 0, 0, 0. Doesn't matter that you lost a pawn. Uh, opposite bishops and the same pawns and et cetera. Um, so yeah, even though they had that little tactic, it, yeah, the computer's not impressed, OK? Just not impressed. Um, but instead, he went here, which was very unfortunate. Because now, yeah, g5 with an elementary mate in 19. But yeah, queen h4 check is annoying. Um, I mean, you have like a couple checks, but then you lose. So here the game ended. He played. He found g5. I don't know what. Why? Well, obviously, just didn't see that. But if he just goes back, the computer doesn't care that you lost a pawn. Equal, 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 equal. Zero, 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 zero. It doesn't matter. H1 doesn't matter. Um, but by trying to go up to not lose his stuff, he he lost the game. Okay. Um, so that's one interesting game. Let's return. Let's go all the way back. Let's just go all the way back for fun, just so we can see this one more time. Um, so we're, tonight we're looking at queen c2. So we have to make some useful developing move. And we're still looking at the move b3. OK, we castle. We're looking at bishop e2. This is the main line, not bishop d3. Uh, and now we're just going to develop. And everybody develops all of their stuff. OK, now let's have a, a look at another game where white decides to play Rook to d1 and rook to c1. Um, and this is the game between Chuchilov and Shirov. It was played in 2009. Uh, Shirov, it's always good to watch his games on these lines. He's an expert at the semi Slav. Him and Anand are, are very, <laughs> very good. They have very good results with it. Um, so when you see a Shirov game, you probably want to watch it if you're studying in a database with these games. Uh, he's very good. So he copied white, very professional. That's what you, you just copy him. Um, and he got off of the b file because there was a rook on the same file as his queen. And uh, a6, which means he's probably going to play c5. So he's keeping control over b5. So it looks like he's going to play c5, and he's not going to let the knight go to b5. So white just waits and c5. So OK, very patient play. And as always, white tries to get um, a positional advantage based on the pawn structure. So C, D, exactly. And he, he took back. Um, and, there's, and now he, he played here, which isn't um, the greatest move. Uh, it's not so obvious why, but OK, he's just going to put his bishop on, on G2. What's wrong with that? Um, it's not so bad. You can go in for the hanging pawns. So he could consider this. Perhaps white didn't want to do this, because at some point I can play D4. And if you just look at black's pieces, we'll leave, look at it in this position. Uh, I got all of these pieces coming at you, uh, you know, and then I, we can do all of this. This guy can come over here. We can do this. And that's a lot of scary arrows. So black actually can get a huge initiative and in, in attack, which is sort of what you want to do whenever, you know, you have the, the, the weaker pawn structure in the center. You got to play dynamically and get an attack. And that's a lot of scary arrows. White, for his part, I mean, we can try to draw as many scary arrows as we can. But that's not as many. So we'll pretend like black is better, because that's what you guys want to hear. You clicked on a semi slav lecture, you want to hear black's better in every line. So well, that's, that's what we'll pretend. You know, White has a lot less scary arrows, so black is better. Do you guys like it? Yeah. Um, so he played g3, and here black played the best move, um, which I guess might not be a very obvious move, I don't think. It's so easy to prove an advantage here with black, but he found a way to do it. He played the move c4. And perhaps, given time, I'll play b5. b4, c3, that would be a disaster. If I, if I, got, the, if I got these pawns on b3 and c3, that would just be game over. So you have to, you have to deal with that somehow. Obviously, we don't really want to take, because that just opens up this bishop. Uh, so what he decided to do was the move a4. 
And so black took here. And now white made a mistake, sort of overlooking the uh, attacking potential of black. Knight to d2. He's just going to go win this pawn with this knight. But now he's bringing all of his pieces away from his king. So we haven't really gone into his territory over there, but we'll, we're thinking about doing it soon. And black now actually played a very aggressive move. And it's, it's definitely the right way to play here. So you can pause at home. I'm going to ask the audience here. I'm going to see if you guys can play like Shirov. So your opponent is going away from his king. So knight g4 is interesting, isn't it? Um, or maybe h5. Uh, yeah, so here, let me just continue with this move. Did you have? This well, is interesting. No, I, yeah, I was also thinking of the same lines. I, I, yeah. H5. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, 9 g4 looks complicated. It looks like you can take on d5 after. Um, you can take on d5 after? White? Yeah, 9 g4, 9 takes d5. What? Oh. After what? Where? Here? Where, where do you want to blunder your knight? Do you want to blunder it now or, or next move? OK. Um, he played h5. Yeah, so he's trying to create some weaknesses. He's going to play h4, and he's going to take on g3. And I'm not going to tell you why white can't play h4 here. I'm not going to tell you, because that's the tactic that will happen in the game. So uh, h4 would be a big blunder. So he did go here. And now black plays h4 himself. And white plays the most natural move. And this is a total blunder. So um, so think here, what would you guys play as black? So this is, this is why I really like this game. We're going to show off you know, the tactical ability of Shirov, who's obviously known. What's that? Sure, yep. Yeah. So hg3, hg3, bishop g3 is exactly what was played. Excellent. Uh, boop. Excellent. And white can't take, so he didn't. If you take here, the big problem is we're taking here. And you're in a lot of trouble. For example, if you go here, I'm going here. This is not going to be very pleasant for you. Um, if here, I can go here and do some of that stuff. Um, so no matter what you do, I mean, here's no better. I think it's the same. I can go here. Uh, and you don't really have a good way of stopping this. For example, I don't know, here. Then we have here. I guess you can block here. But OK, if you go here and here. Um, so there's some issues. You can't really take it. And you don't know a line. So uh, this is the kind of tactic that you want to look for. They moved all their stuff away from the king. So you kind of want to open them up. And, and now he's up a pawn. So for the next couple moves, we're, again, we're going to speed through it tonight. Uh, so you just, you know, some slow maneuvering, and he's up a pawn, so he's just better forever and ever. And we'll get to the final move, which was, was also brilliant. Um, so we're, we're, get, we're getting closer here. F3. And this is a mistake. So they've been just maneuvering around, and Black's just been happy up a pawn for a long time now. And... Uh, Again, white pushes a pawn in front of his king, and that's a mistake. But how do you punish it? This one is a lot tougher. Let's give that other one one exclam. Let's move two exclams. Rook takes f3. Rook takes f3. Wow. All right. Yeah, you've been going to puzzle club, so. All right, good job, Dennis. Um, so yeah, you take on f3. And you again, you can't take it back. The point is, if king takes, queen f5. Yeah, you're, you're going to get checkmated. Uh, if bishop takes, this one is a little bit tougher. Queen c2, and whatever you do, there's going to be some attack here. I haven't studied this in however long. Oh, oh, but if I remember right, this is, this is funny. If, for example, you realize you're getting mated, and you play here, the best move is going to shock you. OK, this, this wins, but also queen f2. Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the more professional, cooler way to do it. 
then yeah, and if here you can now like take or something. There's some cooler way to do it, but you know that was like an eternity ago. So how would I ever, how would I ever remember how to mate you? And <laughs> but okay, but there's nothing you can do. So the point is, you can't really take it with it either piece. So he resigned in this position. Now down two pawns, and also now blacks really crushing you here. Okay. Okay, so that'll have to do it for the B3 line. Let's just check our time here. Okay, we're decent time. <clears throat> okay, so we'll go all the way back to this position again. Tonight we're looking at the move queen to C2 after we develop our bishop. We're going to look now at the main line when you play the anti Moran system here as white. Bishop D3. And so this is a little bit different than the regular Moran in that white has a queen on c2, black has a bishop on d6. Okay. And you can take on c4 now or, or the next move. It's after this here. And this is going to look a little bit more like um, some of the Morans that we've been looking at all week in the sense that after you take back, we're going to play moves like b5, bishop b7, a6, c5, all the normal stuff we had seem to, uh, to see here with the Moran. I also want to mention that, briefly, we're going to look at some games. Um, there was, wasn't a whole lot of interest, so I guess only one person actually specifically requested it. But some people were hoping in this position, I mean, obviously, we, we covered b5 here. Um, we covered this line. And we covered a6. We recovered bishop to b7. Somebody did ask for the move bishop to d6. And so we're going to cover that by transposition. So remember this position, and both sides can castle. So some of the games we're going to look at tonight are, are going to be in that, that system where they, they go back here. OK, let's find where we are. OK, so if bishop d3, then it's transposed into that line. And we're going to look at this last. The more popular move, and we're going to look at this last because those have the coolest games of all time. Um, so we're going to get a, a very similar thing to the regular Moran. Again, we're going to play a6, c5, and that's how we're going to liberate our bishop. OK, rook d1, queen c7. Um, let's see. And so we'll just we'll look at this very briefly here. This is sort of the one of the main lines. And uh, you get a position like this that's relatively equal. Um, you can play g3, d takes e5, bishop g5. Uh, looks like I have a game here. Don't remember it. Dubasay Ribley, 2012. Um, and in this, what I do remember about these types of position is uh, when you take here, this rook actually gets attacked a lot. And the computer always says no matter what you do, everything's always equal, even if your rook's like trapped. Uh, so, so there's probably lots of attacking of the rook. You get to attack the rook as many times as you want. Uh, just keep attacking the rook. Um, um, yeah, so I think here, I think this was the mistake in this game. Um, OK, so this was some game. All right, Ben Simon, decide if that should actually make the cut. Um, he'll decide. OK, well, we'll come back here. And let's look at this move here. This is the much cooler move, bishop to d3. It's led to some of the most beautiful games in chess. And I do want to show you the best game of chess ever played. And like, I mean it. Um, so my, like my favorite game, and I think it's one that a lot of people might actually know because it's so famous. Um, we'll, we'll get to it. So a3, OK, you're going you're to play b4. Rook c8. And there's a lot more common moves that you could play here. Obviously, you don't have to play rook to c8. It's like the fourth most common move. But it's led to some very, very, very fantastic games from this position. It's very sharp. It gets very complicated. So let's, let's enjoy this position here. Knight g5. White attacks h7. Now we'll, we'll wait a second to build suspense. You, what is it? Right, yeah, the, the knight, bishop, queen. So it's attacking it three times, and it's only defended twice. Bishop h2 check. OK, let's check it out. And you wanted to check me? 
Um, I guess I have to go back. And you want to take here, and I take here, and some confusion. This actually looks good for black, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can play king h1. It'd be more complicated, so. And I can play like h6 or something. Yeah, this is, you're right. So no matter what, you're going to get something really complicated like this. It's going to be quite messy. I think this is actually an OK, okay move here. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I don't know if you should take or move over. Uh, this is actually interesting. So I think this actually could be played. Well, we're going to look at two games that played an even more fantastic move. That's a move you might consider. We're going to look at a move that you really would only play if you'd done lots and lots and lots of prep. So c5. c5. All right, you, you attack my h pawn. I blunder my b pawn. If I hang pawns on both sides of the board, you won't be able to take it all. You'll be too confused. That's essential. OK, so black just hammers through the move that he wants to play and doesn't care about what white's doing. I wanted to play c5, and I did it. What are you going to do about it? Well, we're going to look at two different moves here. Probably the most critical move is to take with the bishop. But I do want to show this game because this is the greatest game of all time. Do you know what game this is? Claudia, you might know this game. Yeah, Aronian Anand, 2012. Uh, 2013, sorry if I can't, uh, if I can't say. And yeah, yeah, was Anand, very well prepared. And uh, I believe he said too, this was his world championship prep for Gelfand. And then Aronian unfortunately stumbled into it. So that's, that's not good. World championship prep is, is pretty good prep. Um, so everything is just like hanging, blah, blah, blah. I don't care what you're doing. Knight g4. And OK, you can only do this if you're really well prepared, because you're hanging all of your stuff. Um, well, he played f4. Uh, g3, which looks like one way to do it. Uh, actually, I think this is the best move. There's this move, which is the trickiest, but I don't think it's that good. Yeah, the point is, if you're here, which is good for black. Um, but I think actually he has f3, maybe even f4. He can play a move like this, so I think that actually refutes this. Uh, so I think you actually have to take here. And yeah, so the idea is, is here. Um, so there's all sorts of tricky stuff. So g3 probably can't be played. h3 maybe can be played, but uh, black's going to get a big initiative and something like this. Um, Notice that this pawn's pinned, so sometimes I can take here. Um, something like this could be really scary, which explains the move f4. Uh, now he simply just takes, just ignoring everything that's hanging everywhere, no big deal. And white took back. And now black played the greatest move in chess history until he played his next move, which was even better. So for a few minutes, this next move was the greatest move in chess history. For like a full minute. Yeah. So do pause here if you've never seen this game. Some people have probably already seen this, because I think it's one of the most famous games of all time. But what did black play here? Take about 300 million years to solve it, uh, and then you still won't. And only one person will get that joke. Why 300 million? Um, <clears throat> yeah, let's go ahead and pause your videos. I'm only asking you to play the greatest move in chess history. That's all I'm asking. OK. Um, I'm going to give the answer away. The very, very, very shocking move, bishop c5. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, yeah, you don't get to play a move like that too often. And if you do, it's usually not right. Usually, you're hanging your bishop. But here, it's actually really dangerous to take it. You did this before. You played bishop c5 in a position like this? Uh huh. You played a bishop move, blundering the bishop. Roper versus who? Ah, so you did this against Daniel Bartz. So Mario Roper knows all about this maneuver. So that's good. You should start teaching here, private lessons. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, you want private lessons with Mario Roper, move to St. Louis. Um, that's true. Uh, Bishop e2 was played in the game. You can maybe take this, though uh, I remember just reading analysts and some, yeah, take it, don't take it. People have thought about this for hours and hours. So who knows, maybe you can, maybe you can't. You'd have to you know, waste a lot of your life to figure out this position because even the best people with all the best engines you know, have a hard time sorting all this out. Uh, the best line might go something like this. And black's better, maybe, could be equal, who knows. Impossible to tell. What's the material count? Nobody can figure that out. I called NASA. I said, you know, what's going on here? They're like, we have no idea. Um, so I have them working on it. I'll let you know when they report back to me. So in the game, he played bishop e2, which a huge part of this position is actually the f2 square. So this is actually a pretty bad move. So we're trying to, you know, in all these lines, sometimes we have lots of knights that can go here. Um, so we want queens and bishops to go here. Um, and so I think here Anand actually had to think on his own. I think bishop c5 was still prep. Um, and here he had to think on his own. And he played the best move in chess history, which is good because it's you know, been a couple minutes. It's about time to play an even better move. So bishop c5, easy. <laughs> the second best move, right. Uh, now, now this, I mean, this is why this game is famous, because the next game is also ridiculous. Uh, so yeah, you can't you, you can't figure it out if you've never seen the game. It's impossible. Oh, Claudio, knight <laughs> d to e5. <laughs> yeah, right. The fanciest move. Um, yeah, just simple centralization. Obvious. Uh, what's going on? Who knows? Um, and now, a simple technical task of just winning the game from here. No big deal if you're 2,800 and we're ready for this position. Um, yeah, there's, like, you can't take anything. Um, uh, uh, so he took this, which I think is the best move. And then he played all the best moves, but he still lost because now black's winning. Unless he's not, the computer can't even tell you. It doesn't know anything. Like, the computer, it doesn't even give an evaluation here. It's just, like, three question marks. You know, it would, it would be like 0, 0, 0, or maybe black's winning. It's just, just question marks. That's all it is. Uh, even nobody knows in the computers. Everything they like anal analyze is like wrong in this position because it's ridiculously complicated. Um, but here he took here. And now black has a winning idea. If we could, we would like to put this queen here because then you're going to get checkmated. And this isn't going to help you. You're going to get checkmated. Um, however, if we go here directly, white has a move to save the game. Maybe. Who knows? It's impossible to know. No, but if here, we can trade the queens. And then maybe this is better for black, but OK, you didn't just outright win. So again, another very nice move. He just took our rook, but we want to play queen to h4. But we don't want to allow queen to h7. So very confusing stuff. Probably just taking back the knight is good for black. It's probably good for black. Just taking back is probably good for black. I think I'm up material. It's impossible to know. Right, it was not the move that was played. So how do we make it possible to play queen to h4? without you know, letting him trade queens. <coughs> My kids do that if they laugh. You know, it's, it's funny. They do that too? That's true. Yeah, they do a lot of funny coughing stuff. Uh, so what is the move here for black? You can sacrifice your queen. How are you going to do it? You play queen e5. What? Knight takes. Wait, what? Knight takes. But then you take my queen. I'm gonna go here, and then I'm gonna take your queen. <clears throat> yeah. I'm thinking pawn f5. Pawn f5. Good. Your name was David. Yeah. All right. Good job. And this is your first class. Mm -hmm. All right. Good job. F5. Uh, a really hard move to play because they just took your stuff. You want to take it back, or you want to go checkmate them. 
But f5, and now go ahead and stop me from doing that. Well, he did. Knight to g6, so that's a, a good start. Now queen f6, and OK, th these things are only temporary. After h3, which doesn't really threaten anything, we can just take here. Notice if you go here, we can go somewhere over here, whichever one you think is prettier. Um, so instead, this happened. And now, uh, one more little move here. Another nice little move. Not the best move ever. But uh, a little interference. Notice that we want to take this, right? Because this pawn is pinned. So we want to take here, because that would be checkmate. So we need to find an interfering move. Maybe bishop e3. Bishop e3. And he, he resigned. Um, uh, I think this is the best move. <laughs> um, OK. So obviously, that was just a, a truly fantastic game. A lot of it was prep. Uh, and actually, it would be interesting to see what you guys think. And what you guys think, tell me in the comments. Some people think this game was not beautiful because a lot of it was computer preparation. Um, so do you guys think it's still truly beautiful chess art, even if you know your computer told you to do it? Or does it have to be like original coming from a human brain on the spot? So I assume that he got started before Yeah, this was his prep for Gelfand for the world champ. Um, so yeah, and a lot of this was. I think this move, though, he found on his own, because bishop e2 is not a, a computer move at all. So case in point, it's still beautiful because he has to interpret it. Yeah, so in my opinion, which you can agree or disagree, let me know. Um, even if it's a computer that like figured it out, it's still you know a very beautiful game, and I still appreciate it, even if the human didn't figure it out. Uh, but feel free to disagree. That's that's up to you guys. Okay, and I guess I guess we have one more game that I also have totally forgotten about. Um, let's just let's get to the main position here one more time. Yeah, maybe we talked about that. Maybe we didn't. Who knows? Um, Back to this position. This was a very interesting position after black plays c5. There was a game played upstairs at the chess club in this position. Uh, so you guys might know that game. It was played in 2015. This was the US championship. Uh, Wesley So had white against Sam Sevian. Um, and this is probably the you know more critical line. And I think in this game, like a lot of mistakes were made. So we're going to rush through it unfairly, even though it's way too complicated and requires hours and hours of analysis to properly understand. Um, so in this position, what you can do here as black is you can play g6, trapping the bishop. However, now white gets a whole bunch of pawns. And it's really, really complicated. And I assume it's better for the person with all of the pieces, but it's usually a lot harder to play with all the pieces. Um, so White's going to get a big initiative, um, but you know he's playing Sam Sevian, who is also super good. Both these guys are super good at tactics, so this position favors both of them. Um, so yeah, so now again, there's some material imbalance that is difficult to calculate. Don't even try at home; it's too hard, and it doesn't even really matter. What matters is uh, after the motorcycle gang we pass by. What matters is you know activity and, and peace placement and stuff. And will black be able to consolidate, or will white get a, a humongous attack here? Um, let's see. How did this game end? That's, that's a good move. Um, you see really complicated stuff, and that's why you play this is because it's like super complicated, and so we're not gonna bother. So now I think black black didn't get checkmated, so now he, he's doing great. Um, so all you got to do is not get checkmated, and he didn't get checkmated, so now black should win. Um, boop, boop, boop. OK, and so here, uh, Wesley so had to resign. So, and that's the kind of thing, too, where, OK, even if you're playing a 2800 and Sam's a, a decent grandmaster, especially, um, I don't know how old he was. He was 13 when he became like a GM here. So he's, he was still young at this game. And he still is young. Um, obviously, that's why you can play this. And they can get really, really, really complicated. Now, at the club level, normally your games won't get this complicated because it requires two <laughs> people to play this complicated of a game. However, that's just the semi-slav. Even when we're looking at the most positional lines that are possible, we see some of the most fantastic games and the most complicated strategically and tactically um, positions that can ever arise in chess, which makes the semi-slav so awesome and cool. 
Um, so let me know what you guys think about these uh, anti-Morans. As always, hit like, share, and subscribe. And thank you guys for coming, and we'll see you next week for another exciting episode of uh, The Complete Semi-Slav.